Hey everybody, so on the most recent episode of the channel, we were talking about where the Russian military has revealed some shortcomings, let's say, in the opening two and a half weeks of the invasion. So let me quickly update what the tactical situation is since yesterday. So here's the big picture, and it really hasn't changed from what we were talking about in that episode. Just want to put a finer point on a couple of things I was talking about. So I did mention a land bridge between the Eastern occupied territories all the way to um, the West Coast. The Russians do not control Odessa, the port of Odessa currently. And so that's, that's a key uh, part of what we want to keep them from getting. Um, that, that important seaport. Also, in terms of Kiev, my map showed that uh, they were surrounded, but my, the tactical map that I was talking to, but in, in actuality, as many of you pointed out in the comments, and thanks for that, uh, they are not surrounded. The capital is not surrounded. They are trying to make that happen, but there are doubts whether they ever can make that happen. And as maybe some of you saw today, three leaders of EU countries are meeting with President Zelensky in Kyiv today, or maybe they already have met at this time. So that's a, a good indication that there's a reasonable amount of security in the capital. So just wanted to make those corrections. And also, again, here's your situation on the ground right now. So the advance is stalled, just like we talked about in the episode there. So I wanted to bring aboard Justin Bronk from the Royal United Services Institute. He is a fellow for aviation and technology. Justin is joining us from, from London. And his article was teed up in a recent episode of The Sandbox, and that's with two X's, Sandbox with two X's. Alex Hollings over there does an incredible job with his channel. If you're not subscribed, highly recommend you subscribe. And he was talking about Justin's article, which caused me to read the article, and I used some of the elements he was talking about. So I wanted to bring Justin aboard, and he was kind enough to join me after working hours. Um, so he's uh, putting a pause and is hitting the clubs in, in the uh, West End there uh, to come join me. So Justin, welcome to the channel. Cheers. Great. Good to be here. Good to see you. So let's talk about the high points that you brought out in your article called The Mysterious Disappearing Russian Air Force, particularly around pilot training hours and the use of precision guided munitions, as well as their concerns about what I called red on red, uh, which is uh, fratricide, let's call it. <laughs> Uh, so what are some of those things that uh, that you wrote about in that article? Yeah, so it's, um, I, I think, there's, as you say, there's these main categories where, uh, that to me, kind of explain or at least help to explain uh, what we're seeing being so different from what a lot of analysts, myself included, had expected. Um, uh, the first one, as you say, is, is, is flying hours. Uh, so it's difficult to pin down exactly what each unit gets because Russia is a very, very opaque country, um, uh, which you know, and, and even, you know, in the even in the US Air Force or the RAF, where there's a lot of public scrutiny, you still would struggle to get your hands on on detailed flying data for, for each squadron. But, um, you know, in the sort of official leaks, which are typically kind of put out as, as almost boasts, um, the picture that emerges is about 100 hours, between 100 and 120 hours, um, depending on whether they deploy to a combat zone like Syria, um, in the VKS, so the, the Russian Aerospace Forces as a whole. And that obviously includes also the long-range aviation, the, the transport fleets, the helicopters, and typically their fast jet hours are a bit lower than that. So um, you'd expect the average in a given fighter squadron to be somewhere in the region of 80 to 100 flying hours a year. Um, obviously, that's significantly lower than, than most Western Air Forces aspire to, um, significantly lower than, than a lot of Air Forces, including the US Air Force in particular, but also the RAF, the French, um, actually achieve um, somewhere between 150 and kind of 250 hours, um, significantly more if units are deployed. For example, I was chatting to the guys over at Lake and Heath who are in one of the Strike Eagle squadrons in October, and they were saying, 
uh, about between 200, 240 hours a year. If you're a Strike Eagle guy at Lake and Heath and you're not deployed, and on tours where you on a, in a year where you get a tour in the Middle East, then that might be closer to 500 hours. Um, to give you an idea of the con the contrast, um, and also w within the Russian Air Force, you you get quite a disparity. So weirdly, the, the the sort of ratio tends to be reversed, except in basic training, where where they do make an effort to give guys closer to kind of 120 hours. Um, but in in the frontline regiments, uh, you you tend to get the the more senior pilots flying more and the junior guys flying less. Um, and that's basically because the in the the post Soviet times in the sort of lean decades. You had a, this this phenomenon where there were very very few flying hours to go around. The the Russian aerospace forces in general got a a kind of um, got into a mode where they they tried to maintain their expertise by ha having a few guys who also acted as test pilots for for Sukhoi and Mikoyan, um, who who kept their currency and acted as kind of re repositories of expertise. Um, and the main kind of bulk of the pilots got all very 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 few hours indeed. And that still largely carries over in, in the sort of character. So the expectation might be that the the regimental commander or squadron commander within a regiment will, will get far more flying hours than um, the, the sort of rank and file pilots, which is sort of in many ways the opposite of what you'd expect in some Western Air Forces. What that means is that while Russian pilots tend to be very capable in a single mission for their, their kind of primary mission, um, you know, not as capable as, as sort of top of the pack in NATO, like the US Air Force, um, maybe the RAF or the French on a good day. Um, but, you know, up there with, with a lot of the air forces that also struggle with flying hours, um, but only in a single role. And so when you see these claims about, you know, the Sukhoi 30s or, or the 35 being multi-role fighters, yes, in theory, they can carry a lot of um, different munitions, a lot of, you know, service a lot of different mission types. But in actuality, um, as you yourself will know, and anyone who's, who's, who's spent time in the fast jet community will know well, it's incredibly difficult to stay really match fit and war ready in your primary role with with that few flying hours, let alone trying to go across multiple roles. And, you know, something like close air support is one of the most complex, most difficult things. You, know, you have to have those muscle memories there for, for weapons with geology, communications, nine lines, whatever it happens to be. Um, and so to expect the bulk of the, the VKS fighter fleets to be capable of that sort of thing with those little flying hours is, is probably in retrospect something that we shouldn't have given them as much credit as we did for. Um, it's not the case in some of the strike squadrons. So if you look at the, the Sukhoi 34 fleet, it's very strike oriented. They've flown a lot in Syria. They do have some PGM capabilities, but again, you know, people sometimes tout those as multi-role. You know, they're very specialized in strike. And in Russia, we've just, sorry, in, in Ukraine, we've basically just seen them predominantly flying unguided bomb dropping sorties. Um, you know, in, in many ways, people like myself and, and a lot of the folks, you know, CNA and other places in the States kind of aimed off too far because there was always that temptation to say, yeah, look at all the kit that they've modernized over the past 10, 10 years or so. But of course, they might not be very good at using it. And then you, you, you sort of aim off because the fear is you get accused of, you know, Western bias and kind of hyping down the threat. And as a result, it's, it's better to kind of rate them as though they do roughly work as we'd expect. And then in this case, be be kind of positively surprised, as opposed to being aghast when it all works much better than we'd expected if we'd rated them too. Late. Yeah, I mean, what is that Sun Tzu or something? You know, you 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 don't ever want to underestimate your enemy, but to do the math of what you're describing here, as I said in the episode, that's about eight hours a month, and that's about a sortie a week. That's not enough to do anything really. Like you've very accurately framed it with different mission areas. And as you describe, close air support, nine lines, it gets no more intense, especially if you're talking about a single cockpit kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and Mads Madsen asks, how much training do the Ukrainians get in comparison, which is a great question. Do we know that off the top of our head? Uh, so to be honest, the, the position for the Ukrainians isn't much better. Um, in fact, in many cases, it's worse. Um, yeah, Ukraine has really struggled for for you know the money to, to service those airframes. Um, to keep them you know, within a decent rate of, of of kind of availability across the squadrons. A bit like the Russians, they have some very, very capable and experienced pilots, but they tended to kind of concentrate their flying hours towards them out of necessity. Um, it, it doesn't help that Ukraine's had these, these plans to modernize their fast jet fleets for a long time, really wanting to move towards Western multi-role jets. But as a result has kind of, you know, it didn't have the financial resources to do that, especially with the eight years of ongoing sort of frozen conflict, low level conflict um, against the Russians in, in Donbass. And uh, over that time, it sucked a lot of the resources out of the Ukrainian economy. Um, and so there was, but there was this sort of almost temptation to not invest in the existing fleets um, because they wanted to try and kind of 
push towards modern Western aircraft um, as a, yeah, in, in the medium term. Um, and so there is some significant expertise in, in the Ukrainian Air Force in the fighter fleets and in the ground attack fleets. But once again, it tends to be among a relatively small cadre of really experienced pilots. Um, and it tends to be in single roles. Um, the other thing is that the Ukrainian Air Force has struggled a lot in the past couple of years with, with really archaic and, and unsuitable personnel management systems. And so you've had a lot of people, a um, lot of pilots, experienced pilots, basically leaving the service either because they, they can't, you know, the system can't work around what they need in their lives or just because they've kind of been forced out because of the, the kind of interplay between rank and, and kind of posts and places they're supposed to go. Um, now, of course, you've had loads of them trying to come back in now, but there aren't that many airplanes for them to fly. And, you know, the Ukrainian Air Force now flying you know, U.S. estimates between five and ten sorties um, a day, which is almost nothing. Um, so they're being very conservative. The Russian air defense threat is, is pretty high in most of the country now. So we'll talk about that in a second here to include the R Polish MiG-29 uh idea and, and how that might or might not play out and whether that's viable or even a, a good idea. Um, so before we get to Rob's question, the opening salvo, as you describe in your article, was cruise and ballistic missiles that not unlike the way we did war since Desert Storm, it's an integrated air defense rollback, it's a GCI and command and control, you know, sort of a smart opening move. Um, and then it doesn't look like they took advantage of it in terms of creating local air superiority. So I think that to your point about, let's just call it, it's a peer fight after that. Yeah. What we were seeing in terms of this stuff shot from the ground of SU-25s raging over villages and MiG-29s, and we're not talking about the fake DCS footage, we're talking about the actual footage that was, that was uh, sent across the web of this kind of citizens looking up, it reminded me of, you know, you're in London, so you can imagine Battle of Britain looking up and watching Spitfires and Messerschmitts overhead and who's winning and losing. So this was kind of a visual arena where the ghost of Kiev or whomever would launch alone and unafraid and just pick up targets of opportunity, maybe get a VID, and then it was a visual kind of old school 1v1 kind of fight. Is that is that an accurate interpretation, you think? So in terms of the, the fighter fighter sorties that the, the, the Ukrainians were flying, um, particularly in the first week or so, um, very much old school. So as, as you say, the, that, that initial salvo of, of cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, pretty effective at taking out a lot of, a lot of the Ukrainians' long-range early warning radars. Um, they don't have AWACS. So they're kind of that, if you like, you know, if, if a fighter radar is a, is a torch in a dark warehouse that shows you where things are when you point it at them, but also shows everyone where you are, um, the AWACS is the ceiling light that lets one side see everything. The Ukrainians didn't have that, and their ground-based kind of wide area radars were mostly taken out in the first salvos. So given that also the long-range Russian air defense threat from what they assumed would be fighter patrols as well, although they don't seem to, the Russians don't seem to have done much in the way of um, offensive counter-air sweeps, um, but certainly those long-range S-400 batteries all across the Belarusian border down in Crimea as well, um, and the sort of advancing medium-range stuff, meant that the Ukrainian pilots generally flying very low um, to stay in that radar shadow, stay in the ground clutter. Um, and that meant they're pretty difficult to pick up for, and, and you know, the, the effective range of those, those long range Russian systems is very, very much reduced by doing that. But it does have a number of limitations. Um, first and foremost, their own situational awareness is pretty poor, except if, if the Russians were kind of cruising around a very high altitude, they might've had a lookup capability. Um, but given the Russians were also flying at low altitude, um, you know, their, their own situational awareness is relatively limited. Um, and also the they, main thing is they're burning a huge amount of fuel. Um, so the, the MiG-29 is, is a famously short-legged aircraft anyway. Um, and that's even if you're turning around at high altitude, but jet engines are much more efficient. The Ukrainians flying around at, you know, as we saw from the, a lot of the footage, you know, a couple of hundred feet. Um, and down there, a MiG-29 is lucky if it gets half an hour um, of gas. So, you know, it really, really short sorties. Um, I'm going to be honest, in terms of Ghost of Kiev and, and kind of stuff around there, the Ukrainians seem to have had a few successes with air-to-air -air combat, um, but the only confirmed or confirmable air-to-air -air footage I've seen of a Ukrainian aircraft engaging is a single uh, um, FOX-2, so heat-seeking launch, um, in the first couple of days, which reportedly hit a helicopter. Um, beyond that, 
there may have been one or two successes, um, but I think a lot of the claimed air-to-air kills are, are pretty exaggerated um, on both sides, of course. Uh, certainly the primary success that the Ukrainians have had and the, the main reason the Russians have been unable to gain air superiority is because of the success of their mobile, medium-range and short-range surface missile systems, which have the Russians have not been able to get after effectively, uh, still can't get after effectively, it seems. And that is keeping them down in the weeds as well, where the large number of man pads, so shoulder fire, stingers and igloos and things are, are effective. Um, so, yeah, very much uh, you know, amazing success by the Ukrainian air defense, uh, but it's mostly the SAMs. Um, they have also been flying a lot of really, really courageous ground attack sorties um, with their Sukhoi 25s few 24s that they had operational at the beginning and of course their tb2 uavs um but they've taken a lot of losses for the 25s uh, and a couple of 24s as well because you know as incompetent as they've been in terms of coordinating the russians still have a lot of air defense and they also carry a lot of man pads so if you fly around down there you're going to get shut down if you keep doing sorties well so a let's we don't blaspheme the ghost on this channel justin <laughs> no roger what you said there um i'm kidding uh but to your point, and to segue into the red on red concerns, if you're zorching around at low altitude, yes, you're going to burn gas fast. I, you know, what we need to note is the MiG-29 has no externals. So, yeah, 30 minutes, that's probably going to be it in your RTB. But you're also up, up open to small arms fire, not to mention man pads, um, not to mention a confused populace that cannot discriminate between a Russian MiG-29 and a, uh, a Ukrainian MiG-29. So let's talk about the point you made. And this gets to the command and control as well as the flight hours piece in terms of Russian pilots concerned about getting shot down by their own forces if they go into harm's way. So the the, the biggest thing is that um, you know, a Russian identification friend or foe electronic IFF um, capabilities are more unreliable than Western ones, um, put it that way. And uh, as you, 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 I'm sure, will know, Western ones are by no means infallible. Um, and so they are an excellent mitigation uh, tool to avoid friendly fire incidents in a combined air operation where there is good coordination between um, you know, all the different strike packages and escort packages and whatever else that are supposed to be flying around as part of the recognized air picture, but also those ground-based systems, so in the US case, something like Patriot or NASAMS um, or Aegis, which is supposed to be hooked into that recognized air picture and, and briefed and, and aware of all the different sorties that are going on. And IFF is kind of the thing you layer on top of that to, to act as a fail-safe, but it's by no means um, you know infallible. And when we saw in both Gulf Wars, for example, significant friendly fire incidents, despite Western jets having you know, IFF, uh, along with the SAM systems having IFFs. Um, the Russians, uh, you know, as we've seen, the coordination has been appalling um, across the board. Um, it's not quite as bad as it was now. Um, in the first week, they clearly, uh, so the general staff seem to have got about two weeks warning, but because partly because of the, um, the success of the US and UK in particular, getting ahead in briefing their intelligence, um, publicly of saying, you know, this invasion is going to happen, the order has been given, the, the decision has been made, uh, along with the kind of continued high-level disinformation of saying, oh, you know, it's Western hysteria, we have no plans to invade Ukraine until the last minute. They also seem to have, have basically got a bit paranoid about how, how senior the penetration level was in terms of uh, Western intelligence inside their decision loop. And the reaction seems to have been to not brief uh, down to their operational commanders. So you're getting battalion commanders, for example, getting about 24 hours warning, maybe slightly less, that they're about to go into combat. I mean, in a Western major exercise, that would, you know, 24 hours kind of covers you for syncing up all the radio encryption. N not more than that, really. Um, and the captains and lieutenants seem to have got less than eight hours warning. The sergeants and enlisted seem to have not even known they were going into combat before they crossed the border. Um, you read that across to the air defences, so that, that means they had no time to plan complex air operations. They had no time to plan joint engagement zones. They had no time to brief and get a comms plan working in terms of how they were going to communicate in the event of IFF failure between strike packages going in and out. Obviously, if they took fire, stragglers would be coming in at different altitudes, different timings. Um, and I mean, the, the SAM systems themselves moved in, in many cases, in traffic jams with their radars off, 
um, getting picked off by TB2s for the first few days. Um, and, you know, there's a general appalling lack of coordination. And, you know, you, you layer that starting picture over the complexity of, of that sort of task when you're doing it well. I mean, a, a joint engagement zone where surface to missile batteries are engaging targets in the same big block of airspace at the same time as friendly sorties are going on in that airspace and potentially engaging is a really difficult thing to do. I mean, the U.S. can do it, but it, it's it not kind of off the cuff. Um, and it's something that has to be practiced to an exercise that you know regularly takes a huge amount of digital connectivity, backbone planning. Um, and again, you know, when you say NATO, when when NATO countries do this stuff, it's basically with U.S. enablers that sort of glue that binds everything together. And so, you know, can Russian forces manage a serious joint engagement zone? I I don't think so. Which and by the way, same goes for the Chinese for now. Um, which means, for example, if you if you transpose it from a Ukraine scenario to a Taiwan scenario, for example, if the PLAF, so the People's Liberation Army Air Force, were going across into Taiwan, uh, to Taiwanese airspace for strikes or OCA or whatever, the surface-to-air missile batteries along the Chinese mainland, S-400s and HQ-9s and things, would not basically be able to engage while those Chinese flights were going outbound and until they come back, um, because the, they can't manage a joint engagement zone. Um, so the, they have to def default to the old planning technique, which is just there isn't a joint zone. It's either a surface to a missile engagement zone or it's a, a, a aircraft engagement zone in effect. And so for the Russians, clearly, they probably would have had to fall back on that sort of deconfliction and they didn't plan sufficiently to do it. And then their communications were terrible on the ground for the next couple of weeks. So what, so, yeah. that, what that means, just to put a finer point on what you just said, Justin, is basically no close air support. You're not going to have on call close air support, which is kind of fundamental to the way that we would support a column of tanks or a convoy, right? Because they're going to have man pads in company. And so if, if they own the air defense picture from the ground, then there's no there's no idea that you would have on call class, uh, cast because you, you can't deconflict it. Yeah. Or at least if you can, it's incredibly clunky. Like it's, it's going to take a long time to set up. It's not going to be highly responsive. Um, and and it's going to be much more against kind of fixed targets. So you might well be able to brief to a unit on the ground that there is a strike coming in at, you know, 0530 0, 0, hours that's going to take out this part of the enemy position, we hope. Um, and then, you know, a couple of Sukhoi 25s will come in with unguided rockets or whatever and, and try and do that. Um, but it definitely is a huge, it, it's, it's a break on the way that they're able to um, both leverage their advantage, genuine advantage in, in, having this big multi-layered air defense system with these long range systems at the back and the medium and short range ones theoretically moving forward and, and kind of providing this layer. But at the same time, they can't bring the Air Force in dynamically and kind of mix those two together without horrendous risk of, of friendly fire. So, th so this is just so everybody can frame this. This is a 1985 era execution strategy. This is pre-Desert Storm. The other thing about the planning and Hoser and I talked about, and we, you and I will talk about the no-fly zone viability here in a second, but, you know, writing of an air tasking order. On that air tasking order is all of the IFF information, all of the return to force profiles, all of the other stuff that is required to make sure you don't have a blue on blue. And it doesn't seem, because their comms are in the clear, including their ground comms, so they're not using encrypted voice comms. Um, so there is no, you know, uh, kits and curves and the other sort of things that we, you, if you don't have that, you can't launch kind of thing. They're not even, that's not even in their matrix. So as a function of that, like you said, it's a very antiquated execution, which is surprising as we considered them a near peer threat. Yeah, I, I think slightly um, conditioned because of Syria. Um, so in Syria, they were able to um, sequence close air support and, and kind of run joint engagement zones to a degree, um, or at least they appeared to be able to, to run joint engagement zones. They're certainly able to do close air support, but it's worth remembering what Syria was to them. Syria was a sort of a, a main effort, but a, a relatively small one in terms of numbers on the ground. And so what they did for, for years was to cycle their, not only try and cycle as many units through as possible, but cycle a lot of their best people, a lot of their, uh, they really front loaded the logistics. They front loaded a lot of rear capable officers, some of the best they had, uh, and a lot of kind of special forces and, and gunship units like the Hokums, uh, the KA-52s, for example, that, that are supposed to doctrinally work closely with the special forces. 
Um, and because it was a relatively small number of assets that they were contributing to make decisive contributions in various places to supporting this larger Assad military force, um, they were able to kind of paper over a lot of the cracks. Um, they also used about 10% of the munitions they used were, were, were precision guided. Um, but they were very good at um, highlighting those. You know, they had a lot of camera work. They, you know, camera crews on the sorties where they were doing those. They were good at disseminating the PGM strike footage. And so I think looking at Syria in particular, we got a kind of picture of what the Russian aerospace forces and the, the sort of ground elements they were supporting can do when they have a relatively large planning capacity, a relatively large logistics capacity for the force that they're employing on a relatively small scale, and that's crucially on their time frame. Um, whereas in this case, they're trying to employ on a massive scale, uh, they weren't ready, and they're kind of playing catch up. But also, crucially, people are shooting back at them in a much more meaningful way. Um, so one of the the massive differences in Syria was that there wasn't a medium range sand threat um, that was preventing them from doing what they did in Syria, which was mainly to tote around at, you know, 15,000 feet and above dropping unguided bombs. Um, so they can't do that uh, sustainably in Ukraine because they keep taking losses. It's worth noting, you know, in terms of visually confirmed losses, they've taken about 15 fixed wing aircraft losses so far. Um, and there's probably three or four that we haven't seen because the wrecks came, one of them came down in Belarus. Um, some of them may have come down in firmly Russian controlled territory. Um, but, you know, it, there's at least 15 that have gone down so far, including an Antonov 26, but the rest are, you know, fixed wing combat aircraft. Um, yeah, that's quite significant losses. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so, and you talk about dumb bombs, uh, you know, dumb bombing isn't something that the US military has done since, let's say, the mid 90s. I think our last dumb bomb sortie was in Bosnia. As I've mentioned on the channel before, it was a Tomcat that kind of slung a string halfway across the country. And that was kind of the end of that. Um, so let's pivot to the UAV question. If we could have that question put back up, can you discuss the drone assets that are deployed on both sides and any potential expansion of that domain? So we've seen some footage, which we believe to be there, uh, which was that drone, the Bakashir, the T, uh, uh, so the nomenclature, yeah. Um, so how's that war gone? Who has the advantage and what, what do we think will happen in that, in that case? Uh, so the Ukrainians have definitely been a lot more effective in, in their employment of, of drones so far. Um, both sides are making increasingly regular use of smaller drones, so kind of quadcopter, multicopter type uh, and, and small model aircraft kind of scale fixed wing uh, UAS, um, primarily for artillery spotting uh, and also, of course, to to track um, armor movements and, and, and enemy, enemy vehicle movements. So that's definitely ported over from, from the Middle East, but also that was kind of ongoing in Donbass to a degree in this frozen conflict anyway. Um, that's partly enabled by the fact that the Russians have been very slow to, to bring in most of their electronic warfare kit that they would usually doctrinally employ. Um, and that, that in itself is a, partly a planning function, but it's also probably to do with the, the severity of their own communications issues. As you hinted, a lot of the soldiers being forced back onto mobile phones or at least un not properly encrypted, um, you know, not military grade encrypted radios with cheap Chinese knockoff components in them. Um, and so in that kind of internal communications um, chaos, the, the Russian commanders may, may have felt that they stood to do more damage to their own combat effectiveness by employing heavy electronic attack that, um, capabilities than they would do in terms of getting on top of, of, of degrading some of those Ukrainian drone capacities. So, um, the TB2s, uh, the Bayraktar TB2s that the Ukrainians have been using, it's a cheap, effective system. Um, it's not magic. Um, the they 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 have lost. I mean, they you know they had a lot lost and shot down in Libya, a few shot down in Syria, um, quite a few shot down in Nagorno-Karabakh, and then I've seen one confirmed Sam shot, Sam uh, engagement against the TB2 so far in in Ukraine. Um, but they've certainly lost a few, including potentially on, on the, the major strike on their base, which happened a few, uh, their, one of their main operating bases that happened a few weeks in, sorry, a few days in um, with, with cruise missiles. Um, but, you know, they probably have more than half of the roughly 20 they started with. They got some resupply. So let's say between 10 and 20 left. Um, they're initially, they were initially extremely effective um, in knocking out Russian air defense systems, short range air defense systems. Um, as well as some uh, SA-17 books, um, 
and various kind of soft skin vehicles and trucks and a couple of fuel trains, which was quite interesting. Um, a lot of that was in the first week or so when the Russian forces were really disorganized um, and their air defense coordination at the kind of leading edges of those columns was particularly poor. They've continued to have isolated successes. Um, you know, they clearly, the Ukrainians have been extremely proficient at figuring out, probing where the weaknesses are in terms of the, that forward edge of the Russian air defense and, and electronic warfare potentially picture and kind of exploiting gaps that they find. Um, but I think there's also a slight over overestimation of quite how decisive they've been because the Ukrainians have been, one, one of the areas they're, they're beating the Russians hands down is in the information war. Um, they're absolutely dominating the information space. And so most people have this picture that the Russians are losing you know, 10 times what the Ukrainians are losing. Um, and that's probably not the case. Um, it's probably closer to about maybe two to one um, in most categories, maybe three to one on a, if, if, we're, if we're lucky. But I guess what I'm getting at is we don't have a very good detailed picture of how much the Ukrainians are losing because the Ukrainians have been very good at publicizing Russian uh, their successes against the Russians and very good at not suppressing exactly, but not publicizing areas where they've taken losses. And within that framework, you know, the TB2 strike footage is extremely photogenic. It's very striking. You can, it's decent quality uh, video. You can see exactly what's going on. And so they've been very good at pushing that out onto the airwaves. If you actually look at the numbers, and this hasn't been a single confirmed TB2 kill against a main battle tank, for example, um, but they've knocked out somewhere in the region of about 50 vehicles um, that we've seen footage for. Uh, about half of which were trucks um, and about half a mix of other things. Uh, and that's within about 1,300 confirmed heavy he you know, vehicle and heavy weapon losses that the Russians have taken, including more than 200 MBTs. Those are the things we've had visual confirmation of. It's not so accurate, but not exclusive as a tally. So it's a relatively small proportion, but it probably has a behavioral impact uh, over its kind of material impact. The Russians not much UAV use until the last week. And in the, the last week, we've started to see their all on tens with some, for example, with their four post um, electronic uh, intelligence gathering payloads, as well as you doing artillery spotting and want to direct attacks. So they're getting into it. But of course, again, the Ukrainians have a lot of man pads. The Ukrainians still have medium range air defenses. So both sides increasingly limited, I think, in, in how effective their sort of fixed wing larger drones can actually be. So I think the TB2s have also been effective in just like being photo birds, capturing indirect and direct fire, if not actually delivering the weapon. So some of the footage we've seen, particularly that footage that I teed up in the last episode of them taking out the lead and trail tanks with indirect fire and then blasting the center of the column with direct fire. None of that was TB2 ordnance, but the TB2 is just hanging out overhead, capturing the entire, mm. the entire thing, just like that ambush in another bit of footage, the TB2 is overhead and you can see the RPG come from this emplacement that's off to the side of the road and then yeah. all the troops scatter and, and then it's small arms exchange. But all the drone is doing is kind of act, act, acting as your, your eye in the sky. Um, so that, again, I, I think from our point of view, and we don't know what's happening inside of Russia in terms of what their media is consuming. We hear stories about total suppression, but you have got to say that the Ukrainians are winning uh, the media war for sure. Um, I mean, I get dispatches twice a day from the ministry that outlines what's happening and you, you want to believe that they're being honest about it. And I think they are, but of course they're biasing it against uh, what's happening for the good, you know, because this is their audience is their internal populace. They want them to stay motivated and not, not give up. But I think the other thing that supports the idea that this might be true again, allowing that we only know half the story is like we just showed at the outset, the Russians are not advancing to the degree that they thought they would. In fact, you could say they're stalemated uh, at this point where they are. And taking Kiev is going to be a heavy lift. Taking Odessa is going to be a heavy lift. So their strategic goals are are unmet, and I don't see any you know easy path uh, absent uh, atrocities uh, to to yeah. get there. So let let's talk about um, the. MiG-29 Poland deal and whether that would help or not and what are the moving parts. And then we'll talk about uh, the, the no flies and whether that idea remains a bad one. I know you just did an article at the RUSI.org site on that. 
Um, but let's start by talking about this deal that I would say has kind of been crushed by the Biden administration because of the they were afraid of the optics going by Putin. Again, I'm thinking it's time we stop caring about that. Um, and I have my own op opinion about its viability long term. But what do you think about the idea of giving them more MiG-29s right now? So in the medium term, I think if there is a way to supply them with MiG-29s, but more to the point to, to provide a, a, a safe and not too escalatory kind of, uh, maybe maybe it's worth doing the MiG-29s, um, but you, you would basically have to run at least weeks, if not a few months worth of training and familiarization um, flights for those Ukrainian MiG-29 pilots to fly, for example, Polish ones. And from what I understand, uh, Bulgaria, and I think it's Croatia who also has them um, in, in NATO, but uh, I have basically said we're, we're not giving them up because we need them. <laughs> but the Poles are, are clearly keen to, to exchange theirs for uh, sped up purchases of all replacement F-16s um, or perhaps sped up F-35 deliveries. But um, it's uh, it, the, the, the cockpit layout is completely different. So while I suspect with with you know a few days of study book study and, and one or two familiarization flights, the Ukrainian MiG-29 pilots could almost certainly fly the Polish MiG-29s safely. The uh, it will probably take them a lot longer to be combat effective in them because the the particularly the weapon switchology, which in a MiG-29 is very complicated, um, or at least a, a traditional old school one like the Ukrainians had, and, and the Ukrainians had done their own domestic upgrades to to a degree within their MiG-29, so they're different again from the Soviet baseline. Um, it will take them a while to get sort of current on that and enough to be combat effective in what is a very, very high threat environment. Um, it's also worth remembering that that it'll take a long time, I mean, again, weeks minimum, but probably months, to strip out all of the um, you know, IFF, crypto, uh, particularly crypto, actually, um, nav aids, kind of radios, various other bits and bobs, um, which is NATO specific um, equipment that has been installed on those Polish MiG-29s that can't be transferred legally outside of NATO. And even if it could, um, probably represents an unacceptable security risk, particularly when it comes to crypto and radios, um, because there's a very high chance that if they're supplied to Ukraine, some of them will be shot down and fall in Russian, ter Russian controlled territory. Um, so the act of taking all of that, that stuff out and then ensuring that the, it doesn't affect the safety and airworthiness and viability of the aircraft's avionics, um, and also where you have to put new stuff in to substitute, you then also have to sort of test at least a little bit, test those, and even though you, if, even if it's you cut corners compared to what you'd have done in peacetime, that will all take a while. Um, and then you probably know no country is going to agree in NATO to have them fly to Ukrainian soil because there's a legal there's a whole set of legal um, obligations about on the country that an aircraft takes off from when it flies overseas. And so, you know, it's why you saw the polls, for example, saying we're delighted to hand these over. We're going to send them unilaterally to U.S. custody in Germany and then they can fly from there. And the Germans and the Americans going, no, we didn't agree to that. You, we're happy for you guys to send them, but, but we're not going to do it. Um, and so, again, with all of these things, you sort of think if you were serious about this, you'd be doing it quietly. And if you were smart about this, you'd be doing it quietly. Because, again, you're already talking weeks, probably a couple of months to get these things to a point where they can be sent and, and to get pilots trained up. And then you're going to have to disassemble them anyway. So you might as well disassemble them and put them on trucks and, and take them quietly across the border to some air bases without fanfare. Um, as I said, though, you know, it's a high threat environment. The MiG-29 pilots that the Ukrainians have are almost exclusively air defense pilots and the Russian Air Force is not the main threat. Um, and if they start doing gun runs and you know, rocket and bomb attacks um, on things like that convoy that everyone wanted, wanted them to hit, they'll go down in, in a couple of days. Um, and then you know, half an hour performance, they're not going to be able to push out into the east of the country where the worst bombardments and bombing is happening around Melitopol and, um, and uh, Kharkiv. So really, we should be supplying, working out a way to supply them with surface to missile systems, um, to supply them with SA-8s, with SA-11s, Strelas um, that we do, as in, as in vehicle mounted Strelas, that we do have in the NATO inventory. Various European NATO countries have Russian and Soviet origin systems that they maintained in varied condition. But, you know, reconditioning those and quietly sending them across the border, things that the Ukrainians already know how to use and have a logistics and support mechanism for, 
that's what would be most effective against the Russian Air Force. Um, so so yeah. I, I think the reason we don't do things quietly, uh, let me just give them the benefit of the doubt, is the deterrent effect of saying, hey, we're going to do this, because I concur. Uh, if, the, if this is supposed to be of some tactical value, we are broadcasting our moves way too much. Just to remind to the point you just made, as I said in the, ep the last episode, uh, Petro Poroshenko, Poroshenko, rather, former president, uh, listed their needs as surface-to-air missiles, anti-tank missiles, and ammo, right? So that's what you've just said that they could use. And, and in effect, uh, we can mount a pretty decent defense against the capabilities that we've already talked about. So let's, for our last bit of this discussion, let's talk about a no-fly zone, because you're still hearing the chattering class, let's just call them, demand a no-fly zone. And also... Uh, you know, President Zelensky has said, you know, close the skies. Um, so let's talk about the article you, that you just wrote uh, at uh, at the your, your site at rusi.org about a no-fly zone. Is it viable? Is it something that we should be thinking about? So, I mean, look, I'll press you this by saying instinctively and emotionally, of course I want to see, a, you know, NATO air power come screaming in and, and drive the Russian air force out of the Ukrainian skies and smash up a bunch of, of Russian kit because it's an aggressive invasion that's killing thousands of civilians a week. Um, but at the same time, I, a, I don't think it would be militarily particularly effective, first and foremost, because the majority of the, the atrocities, you know, the bombardments going on, uh, particularly in places like Kharkiv and Mariupol at the moment, and potentially Kiev uh, as we go into the next week or two, um, are coming from ground-based artillery, and a no-fly zone doesn't touch ground-based artillery. Uh, most of the uh, bombardment that's not being done by artillery is being done by cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. And again, that it wouldn't be affected by a no-fly zone at all. Um, the aerial cruise missile launches are being done from Russian strategic bombers, long range, so technically long-range aviation, so strategic bombers, um, which incidentally are dual-rolled, so they're part of Russia's nuclear deterrent as well. So going after them, even if we could, and they're launching from well inside Russian airspace, um, would be mad. Um, and so I, a, on that level, it wouldn't be terribly effective in stopping the, the appalling bombardments of civilian uh, areas. It also um, would require a huge amount of bombing of, of Russian surface to air missile systems. So you're not talking about shooting down one or two Russian planes and the rest kind of running away. You'd be talking about a sustained campaign to go and uh, hunt down the Russian surface to air missile systems all over the country in Ukraine and also in Belarus and Russian territory. Um, because you'd have to go after those long-range systems. If you wanted to mount combat air patrols over, let's say, Mariupol or Kharkiv, you'd, ha you'd have to have tanker orbits well within the range of, of S-400 systems that are not in Ukraine but could hit those tankers. Um, so you, you, it's not viable militarily without a massive escalation. Um, and at any rate, only the U.S. has the munitions and the aircraft to do it. So when people sometimes say, oh, well, you know, it needs to be a U.N. mission which you can't authorize through the Security Council because Russia and China will veto it. But, you know, under the auspices of Article 51 or something, um, you know, the rest of the world wouldn't wouldn't see that. They'd see a U.S.-led coalition, the willing, going in and, and from a lot of countries' perspectives, escalating things or at least risking catastrophic escalation. Um, it's also worth remembering how unbelievably unified the entire world pretty much has responded to this invasion. So you've had extraordinary, rapid and incredibly harsh sanctions that will cripple the Russian economy, uh, are already crippling it, but are, are literally unsustainable. Um, it, most interestingly of all, going after the Russian um, central bank. So basically saying that all of the currency that they hold, um, about 300, slightly over $300 billion worth in foreign banks, so the Fed, the Bank of England, is effectively meaningless. They've just literally basically said that money doesn't exist. They've frozen it and not allowed to access it, which has never been done ever and is a complete showstopper. It means the Russian ruble cannot be traded without going into total freefall. And now they're going after the oil and gas. And even Switzerland has, has, has been implementing this. And, and Israel, the Chinese have abstained rather than supporting Russia in the Security Council. The Indians have done the same. And so there's basically this enormous unity in the world, even among countries you typically expect to support the Russians against this invasion because it's indefensible. The moment you start talking about actual military confrontation, which a no-fly zone would be, between NATO assets, you know, even if they're not under a NATO banner, US 
aircraft basically supported by some others you will shatter that that unity and you will give russia diplomatic openings to start trying to evade sanctions particularly even in the U in the in the eu and nato countries like you know frankly germany italy spain maybe even france certainly finland and sweden which are not in nato but are in the eu which have been very supportive up to now would immediately go whoa 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 whoa, whoa. we didn't say we were going to go and shoot at the russians and so you would you'd fracture that political unity and finally you'd give several really key gifts to putin um he is in a complete he has a losing hand right now he can't beat the ukrainians that that the the goal of taking ukraine forcing regime change is done there is no way that is now feasible. So now he's fighting over what kind of scraps he can get. He's trying to pulverize the cities that he can in order to try and force concessions from the Ukrainian government in terms of what a ceasefire looks like, in terms of something he can sell to try and stay in power to his own domestic audience. But he's he's imposed these crippling costs on the Russian government, on the Russian society, on the Russian oligarchs, all the elites. He's cut Russia off from the entire world. He's burned all of its geopolitical friends and power and you know, influence networks. And for what? A couple of Ukrainian cities that he might be able to take at some point that he's destroying in the process and a Ukraine that is implacably united against Russia that they've lost forever. So he is in a completely losing hand right now. He can't. There is no win condition for him now unless we give him a NATO intervention. The moment we do that, a couple of key things change. First of all, their retrospective propagandist justifications they've been pushing for a month or more of saying we have to invade Ukraine because we're preempting NATO going into Ukraine. We're saving the Ukrainians from NATO and we're saving Russia from a Ukraine that has NATO forces in it. A, you give them ammo to, to keep making those justifications and half the world will go, see, maybe the Russians were telling the truth about that. Secondly, you give them an excuse for why their armed forces are being you know, smashed by the Ukrainians, which you know Russia is, is very, very dismissive of Ukraine culturally and politically. And so having your armed forces beaten by the Ukrainians, this pillar of Russian identity, is crippling for the, for the regime. It's probably lethal for the, for the regime long term. The moment you bring any NATO forces in, it's a case of, oh, no, no, you see, we're not being beaten by the Ukrainians. We're being beaten by the Americans. It, this is the existential fight we always knew would be hard. And finally, you give them an excuse to escalate to tactical nuclear use. Um, because, A, from a cynical point of view, um, if they want to change the current narrative where they are losing, there is no win condition for them here now. There is that potential incentive from a totally morality external perspective of saying, if we use a nuclear weapon, you know, like say in a forest outside Kiev or something to make a point, we can force them to negotiate and accept a ceasefire on terms we can sell to our population or whatever. But even in the Russian system, that's probably too far. They probably can't sell that because no Russian in their right mind can accept the notion that, that Ukraine is a strategic threat to Russia. It's a non-NATO, it's a non-nuclear, non-NATO state that they were party to the treaty that disarmed. So in that context, they can't probably justify it. The moment you put NATO forces in, it becomes an existential conflict where there's a, a viable escalation ladder that they can model. And they A, they can justify it. And B, from a non-cynical point of view, if you take their security paranoia at face value, they're really vulnerable right now. They have about 65 to 70 percent of their usable ground power and more than that of their logistics capacity tied up, bogged down in Ukraine, being really seriously attrited. They've lost more than 10 percent of the force in three weeks. Um, and so from their own perspective, the moment you put that carrot in of NATO actual direct conflict with NATO assets, and there's a very short escalation ladder there to wider conflict with NATO, they have a legitimate security fear because they can't defend against a NATO push from Eastern Europe or anything else. And so their own defensive incentives are to immediately escalate to tactical nuclear use so that the West backs off because it becomes an existential crisis for them. So, you know, people say something must be done. I would say we're doing everything that we can short of war. We've passed, we're passing massive financial aid, massive amounts of weaponry, and it's proving decisively helpful. The Ukrainians are winning. The Russians cannot beat Ukraine. It's about what the ceasefire looks like now. And unfortunately, how many civilian Ukrainian civilians and troops are killed by the Russians before that happens. The only thing that can give Russia an out is if we intervene. Justin Bronk from RUSI. His writings are at rusi.org. You can also follow him on Twitter. Justin, keep your phone on because we're going to want you on the channel again as this evolves. Thank you for your sage analysis and for your sober point of view. Uh, thank you for joining us in uh, the evening in London there.
and uh, look forward to connecting with you uh, again when the situation warrants it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Mooch. All right, that'll do it for this episode. Let me go ahead and put up the t-shirt link in the chat. If you want to help support the effort there in Ukraine, we have a t-shirt campaign going on. Here's the, the link for the t-shirts. This is what they look like. It's a variation, as you guys know, of the channel logo. And also just a reminder, we haven't talked about this in some time, the Punks Trilogy still available from US and I Press at this link. And I was just talking to the publisher today. If you use the Punk YT discount code, you get 15% off. All right. Well, thanks for joining. We have a record number of people here, over 4,300. Uh, so appreciate the interest. I think we'll all agree that Justin's point of view was amazing. And we'll have him on again uh, as, again, like I said, as the situation dictates. So thanks, everybody. And I look forward to talking to you again, too. Thanks to our producer. And uh, again, we'll look forward to talking to you guys again soon.